Today at one, the government should apologise and pay compensation to women affected by the increase in the state pension age. An ombudsman says women born in the 1950s are owed money and recommends Parliament should ensure they get it. One of us are dying every 30 minutes without justice, without knowing that now Parliament have the decision to make good what it actually got wrong. After years of campaigning, it's an outcome that could affect millions of women. Well, the Department for Work and Pensions says it is considering today's report. Also on the programme. Affecting saving, lending and mortgages, interest rates are held at 5.25% for the fifth time in a row. The Horizon IT scandal. The BBC has found that an expert witness was asked by a post office prosecutor to consider changing his testimony. And spotting breast cancer using artificial intelligence. How AI picked up tiny tumours missed by the human eye. And coming up on BBC News, it's a big night for Wales. They'll be one win away from Euro 2024 if they can beat Finland in their playoff semi-final in Cardiff. Hello and welcome to the BBC News at One. The government should apologise and pay compensation to women affected by the increase in their retirement age. That's the recommendation from the Parliamentary Ombudsman, which has been looking at the impact of raising women's retirement age to bring it in line with men's. The report says the Department for Work and Pensions hasn't acknowledged its failings or put things right for those affected. Campaigners say millions of women born in the 1950s have suffered financially because they weren't properly warned in advance about the changes. Sancha Berg has the story. After years of protesting, a victory for women born in the 1950s. The government changed the age they'd get their state pension and didn't let them know in time to plan. Our reaction is today is we're glad the report is finally out and with Parliament. Parliament actually decided to take the action to increase the state pension age for women and they didn't do the job properly. The Department of Work and Pension should have told us and they didn't. And is time important? 270,000 of us have died since we started this campaign eight or nine years ago. So one of us are dying every 30 minutes without justice, without knowing that now Parliament have the decision to make good what it actually got wrong. Many say they struggle with money, suffering financial hardship. What they did was absolutely wrong. It, they could have had a pen and a, and a paper and an envelope and a stamp and sent it to all of us in 1995, was it, when they came up with this decision? Uh, and let us all know, and we would have all been prepared. I want to ask you all to help. It was the post-war Labour government, led by Clement Attlee, that brought in pensions for all, starting at 65 for men and 60 for women. So that we can buy what we need. Nearly 50 years later, the Conservative Prime Minister, John Major, decided that should change to 65 for all, a change that was accelerated by the coalition government. That led to confusion for some, ignorance, then hardship for many. The Ombudsman said that women should be compensated, but it also said the Department for Work and Pensions had made it clear it would not comply. The Ombudsman said this was unacceptable. In a statement, the Department for Work and Pensions said it would consider the Ombudsman's report and respond in due course. It said the government had always been committed to supporting all pensioners in a sustainable way. So it is quite a big day for the WASPy campaigners. I've been speaking to them since 2017, when this was relatively new. They'd only been going a year or two. And I have to say, what struck me then about them was a lot of them were quite embarrassed to be campaigning. They were women who had been very organised, they'd planned their lives, anticipated their pension coming in at 60, and then it just didn't arrive, or a year or two before they learned it wasn't going to come. So this was all new to them, and now they hope this will be, as one put it, 
the beginning of the end of a long campaign. Sancha, thank you, Sancha Berg, and let's also talk to our political correspondent Leila Nafu because Leila, this report seems to really put the ball in the government's court now. Yeah, Jane, I mean, the Ombudsman has no power to compel the government to act. It can only recommend. And it says in its report in pretty strong terms that from what it's heard from the Department for Work and Pensions, that it doesn't expect the government to volunteer to do anything. So it's asking Parliament to try to find some way to intervene. But it's not clear what that would actually mean. In theory, a backbench MP could try to amend an existing piece of legislation that's going through the Commons uh, to try to force action. That doesn't seem likely at the moment. There could be some sort of vote, but that would be unlikely uh, to be binding. All the Department and Downing Street are saying for the moment is that they're going to consider the report. That obviously tells us nothing. MPs have been asking questions already about it in the Commons this morning. They've been told there's a hope for the Minister to deliver a statement in the Commons before the Easter break next week. But why would the government have an interest in putting off considering this report? Because it could result in a costly compensation bill. Remember, they are already dealing with the Horizon uh, post office IT scandal uh, victims. They've got the infected blood scandal compensation also coming down the track, both of which could be sucking up potentially billions of pounds. Labour haven't really responded to this either. They would obviously inherit this situation if they t were to win the next election. So yes, this does add pressure on the government, but it's no means, by no means certain when or if uh, anything will result. Leila, thank you. Leila Nathu. In the last hour, the Bank of England has announced it's holding interest rates at their 16-year high of 5.25%. It's the fifth time rates have remained unchanged after 14 consecutive increases. The bank has been keeping interest rates high to try to slow sharply rising prices and now says things are moving in the right direction. So with inflation on its way down, when can we expect interest rates to follow suit? Our chief economics correspondent, Darshini David, is with me for more on that, Darshini. Jane, thank you. Yes, you might wonder if the rate setters at the Bank of England failed to tune in yesterday when we told you about this, that fall in inflation, that blue line, to its lowest in over two years, and it's expected to drop to 2% that target fairly soon. Now, the bank has hiked interest rates, the red line, 14 times to engineer that. It's working, so why aren't they cutting them? And that's because some prices are still rising fast. Plus, we saw car insurance, rents, mobile phone tariffs, and broadband. Part of what's called services inflation running at over 6%, that troubles rate setters. Ultimately, decisions about your borrowing and saving costs depends on these. The nine people on the bank's interest rate panel. Their job is to get inflation to its 2% target and keep it there. You can see they're not all in agreement. This is how they voted last month. Two of them over there wanted to raise rates even further. But now they're more relaxed, feel that price pressures are easy. So all now are content for rates to at least stay unchanged. In the words of their governor, they're not yet at the point where they can cut interest rates, but things are moving in the right direction. Now, that raises hopes for borrowers like Garnish, who's now looking to fix his mortgage later this year after seeing repayments soar on his variable rate loan. Never in a thousand years did we think the rates would go up to this level. Um, I think there's lots of people in our situation um, where rates have gone to that, that sort of level, hundreds of pounds extra. There will probably be people who can't afford to carry on paying that. And, and the hope of interest rates reducing, reducing, it's not happened as quickly as I think everyone expected. So what the million or so borrowers remortgaging this year really want to know is when the first cut will come. And they're not alone. Rates have been kept on ice too, you can see there, in the EU, also in the US. So, spring has finally arrived, but it may be June or even August before that first cut. Jane. Oh, Darshini, thank you. Well, the energy crisis caused by the war in Ukraine led to the biggest jump in people living in absolute poverty in the UK for three decades. That's according to new official figures. Our BBC Verify correspondent Nick Erdley uh, is with me. Nick, first of all, just remind us of that definition. What is absolute poverty? Absolute poverty is about your standard of living. If you can't afford a certain standard of living, then you are classed as living in absolute poverty. And that definition matters because it's the one that the Prime Minister tends to use when he talks about poverty. 
in Parliament. What these figures do today is the remind us actually, I think, about a lot of what Dashini was just talking about, things that a lot of people would have seen in their everyday lives, higher prices squeezing household spending, particularly if you're on a lower income. These figures show that 12 million people in the UK in the year up to April 2023 were living in what was classified as absolute poverty. And it's the biggest rise in 30 years. It went up 600,000 over the course of that year. Now, some of the reasons are obvious. Inflation being one of them, rising energy prices being another crucial one. The government argues that if it hadn't introduced the cost of living support that it did, the 1.3 million more people would have fallen under this definition. And it is important to say that since April 2023, a lot's changed. Inflation, as we were just talking about, has gone down. Pensions and benefits went up considerably in that period as well. But particularly in an election year, it's a reminder of some of the real challenges that households have been facing. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much for now. Nick Irby, thank you. In the Horizon IT scandal, the BBC has learned that an expert witness was asked by a post office prosecutor to consider changing his testimony to avoid what he believed was a damaging concession. An engineer from Fujitsu, Gareth Jenkins, rephrased parts of a report about the IT system after advice from barrister Warwick Tatford. That evidence was used in the case against sub-postmistress Seema Misra, who was wrongly jailed while she was pregnant. Our business correspondent Mark Ashdown has the story. The Horizon IT system was central to the post office scandal. Testimony supporting its credibility was used time and again to prosecute sub-postmasters accused of theft or fraud. One was Seema Misra, accused of stealing £75,000 and eventually sent to jail while she was pregnant. At her trial in 2010, Gareth Jenkins, the architect of Horizon, was called as an independent witness. But evidence submitted to the public inquiry raises questions about just how well he carried out that role. He sent his draft witness statement to Warwick Tatford, the post office's barrister. In it, he said he could not 10%, he meant 100%, rule out problems with Horizon screens as a possible cause for some cash shortfalls. Mr Tatford responded saying, please rephrase, as this will be taken as a damaging concession. In the final testimony, Mr Jenkins said no scenario had been presented that could explain losses because of poorly calibrated touchscreens. Mr Jenkins also agreed with an expert defence witness that there could have been issues with training on the Horizon system. He wrote, I support his finding regarding discrepancies in cash in almost every period. Mr Tatford wrote back, your agreement might be interpreted as a concession that the Crown, i.e. the post office's case, is entirely flawed. Again, Mr Jenkins changed his statement and instead wrote cash discrepancies indicated at least poor management within the branch and probably something more serious. By law, all the draft documents should have been shared with Seaman Misra's defence team, but all they saw was the final version after all the changes had been made. She told us she found it horrible, the idea that words were being put into the mouth of an expert witness, and her former solicitor said it was clear her client had been denied a fair trial. Seema Misra has previously spoken about the toll her conviction took on her. If I wouldn't been pregnant, I would have killed myself. Because for me, like, I've, I've given a bad name to my family, being to prison. So I always say, you know, the youngest hen kept me alive and the eldest one kept my husband alive. Giving evidence to the public inquiry, Warwick Tatford apologised unreservedly to Seema Misra and added this admission. No, I think it is unfair and I, I, I'm sorry for that. I can... Um... I think what I was doing was just trying to clarify matters and make things clear. But I, I, I do agree that, that I've overstepped the mark there. Gareth Jenkins is one of just two people involved with the whole scandal currently under police investigation. What this evidence shows is that the net should be probably widening to take in a much wider group of people, including lawyers working within the post office and outside the post office. Neither Mr Jenkins nor Mr Tatford wanted to comment further at this stage. The post office said it was focused on righting the wrongs of the past. Mark Ashdown, BBC News. An AI tool being tested by an NHS trust has identified tiny breast cancer tumours in 11 women which had been missed by doctors. The technology was piloted alongside NHS clinicians and analysed the mammograms of more than 10,000 women. Our technology editor Zoe Kleinman has the details. 
So this is one of the extra cancers that was picked up by the AI. But that is so tiny. Yes, it is indeed. And it, you can see why uh, two human readers would have just looked through, compared it. It looks very much the same. I would have said that that's normal. Here in Aberdeen, Dr. Gerald Lipp has just led the first NHS evaluation of an artificial intelligence tool called NIA, designed to help improve breast cancer diagnosis. The initial results are encouraging. It's almost like another colleague and uh, someone has a, a second, sort of second opinion looking over your shoulder and helping you. So one human reader and then the AI doing the next read, we could turn, move our turnaround time from 14 days down to three days. And you know that anxiety, if you've had a mammogram, or any tests in the hospital, I've had tests, you're kind of waiting on that result and you want to know it as soon as you can. So anxiety and, uh, and sort of is another factor in this as well that we want to try and reduce. Barbara's cancer was so tiny, Dr. Lip and his team didn't spot it, but Mia did. I'm just incredibly grateful. If I hadn't had that, then I don't know when I would have found it. The early diagnosis meant that Barbara needed shorter and less invasive treatment. She told me without AI, her tumour might not have been spotted for another three years at her next routine scan, by which point it would have been a lot bigger and might have spread. You say cancer and they say, oh, I'm so sorry. And I felt a fraud because it was so small. It's just so easy. There's no extra appointment or anything. And then when you have the operation, it's at a very early stage. So it's minimal compared to what it could be. AI is good at this when it's properly trained to spot early, tiny symptoms of a specific disease. But this isn't perfect yet. It has a tendency to over-diagnose. And also, because of current health guidelines, it's not allowed to learn on the job and evolve as it's used. Right now, this tech is still being researched. Mia was built by the medical firm Kieran and runs on computing power from Microsoft. It was fed millions of images of scans from women around the world to enable it to recognize specific signs of potential breast cancer. Within five years, some experts say AI will routinely be used in cancer diagnosis. I struggled to see some of the symptoms Dr. Lip showed me, and I only looked at a few of them. Currently, human specialists analyze up to 10,000 scans per year. The hope is that AI tech like Mia might one day reduce that workload and the strain that goes with it. Zoe Kleinman, BBC News. The time is 17 minutes past one. Our top story this afternoon. A watchdog recommends the government apologizes and pays compensation to women affected by the increase in the state pension age. Still to come here, why head teachers in England say they're missing out on vital funds to fix leaking roofs and outdated classrooms. Coming up on BBC News, former Wales star Louis Rees Stamet, who traded rugby union for the NFL, has caught the eye of three unnamed teams after a day of testing yesterday as he continues his quest to break into American football. Could working in extreme heat increase a woman's risk of miscarriage or stillbirth? As our planet heats up, a new study in India shared with the BBC has found pregnant women face twice the risk of miscarriage, stillbirth or low birth weight if they worked in very hot environments compared to those in cooler places. Researchers are now working with UK scientists to better understand these findings, saying they could have an impact on advice for pregnant women globally. Our global health correspondent, Tulip Mazumba, has been to Tamil Nadu to meet some of the women who took part in this study. Summer is coming. And India is predicted to become one of the first countries where temperatures will top the safe limit for healthy people who are just sitting out in the shade. It's workers like these who will be, and already are, most affected by the heat. These workers start early in the morning to avoid the worst of the hot sun. It's around 28 degrees at the moment and very humid. I've been sweating quite a lot all morning. This is just one of three jobs Sandia has to help feed her two children. There was also a third child who she lost six months into her pregnancy. I would work the whole day in the heat. My legs would swell. I felt thirsty all the time and out of breath. One day I was cutting the crops. I suddenly felt intense pain and I started bleeding. I went to see the doctor and he told me my baby had died. 
Sandia is one of hundreds of pregnant women who took part in a study about the impact of heat stress at work on pregnancy. 800 pregnant women took part. Researchers found that those who worked in extreme heat faced double the risk of stillbirth, preterm birth, miscarriage and low birth weight. The authors say the findings are important for women everywhere because these problems could be seen at much lower temperatures in countries like the UK. Researchers in the study used this special temperature gauge to measure the various ways heat affects our bodies. There is a long way to go to, in order to find the exact biological mechanism behind this that may help to uh, improve the reproductive health of the women globally and before this was all open, open, open. so the sun would just be on the workers. Yeah. At this brick kiln on the outskirts of Chennai, the owner has erected these giant sheds to better protect workers as temperatures rise. Making these and other changes, he says, is also making him more money. They used to have more health problems, but since we started using the machinery and got these sheds, they don't suffer as much. This kind of work, mainly undertaken by women, is only going to get harder as our planet heats up. And scientists investigating the impact on the most vulnerable warn the world must adapt now. Tulip Mazumdar, BBC News, Southern India. Just to tell you, if you'd like to see more about that story, there's a documentary on the BBC iPlayer. It's called India's Mothers Bearing the Heat. Tens of thousands of children are at risk of being groomed and coerced into crime by organised gangs, according to a leading child protection expert. Professor Alexis Jay, who revealed the extent of sexual exploitation in Rotherham, is warning of an urgent but preventable crisis. Following an inquiry for the charity Action for Children, she's concluded there's no national strategy for dealing with this type of crime. Here's our Home Affairs correspondent, Tom Simons. If they knew you were talking to me right now, what would they do to you? I don't think I'd be alive. Seriously, I genuinely think I would end up six feet under. That's why we're not revealing Joe's identity or the area where he as a child worked for a criminal gang in Scotland. If they wanted me to go and sell something for them, I had to go and do it. If I had to go and hit someone for them, I had to go and do it. Or it was me that was paying the price. Why are children being exploited and coerced into crime? Professor Alexis Jay took evidence from 70 people and organisations in an inquiry commissioned by the charity Action for Children. A big factor in it appeared to be loneliness, isolation, the desire and how good it felt to be part of something, even though it was criminal activity. They control my life without me realising they were controlling my life. What I found most shocking generally was the casual violence that was involved, knife crime of course, but they also heard about the use of machetes, bats and hammers and axes. It's driving a rise in violent youth crime and she says the government, all parties, need to act. It needs a national focus and a national strategy and equally importantly it needs the introduction of a new offence of child criminal exploitation. You're saying there's no strategy at the moment? None. No, it's uncoordinated, fragmented, piecemeal. The Home Office is focused on fighting crime gangs who use dedicated phone lines to sell drugs. Five million pounds has been earmarked over three years to help exploited children and their families. But Joe's mum said she asked for help and for years no one listened. I tried everything. I tried phoning the police, I tried going to school, I tried social services. What happened? They told me it was all in my head, like I was a bad parent. There was nothing wrong. She was left alone in a battle for the loyalty of her son against the gang. You want to kill them, but you can't. You can't do anything. You can't say nothing. But she clung on to Joe, and with the help of youth workers, is now free of the gang. Tom Simons, BBC News, Glasgow. Head teachers in England say they're missing out on vital funds to fix leaking roofs and outdated classrooms after money was diverted to schools found to have crumbling concrete. 
Some schools have been waiting decades for money for repairs, but those with the dangerous concrete known as rack are now taking priority, as our education correspondent Hazel Shearing reports. In 2005, 14-year-old Mark Malik appeared on TV campaigning for a new school building at Joseph Leckie Academy in Warsaw. Nearly two decades later, we invited him back to talk with current students about what's changed and more importantly, what hasn't, now that the school has given up hope of getting the building replaced. Has it ever flooded in anything you guys have been here? Yeah, was quite a lot when it rained. It's been so many years and still, like, so many things have not improved. We have, like, a music room, like, when it's not raining, like, the, the roof is leaking like, into the instruments and everything. And it puts me off that I have to come to this building and work here. All the lessons that are, like, in different buildings makes it bad, makes it bad here. The school hall dates from the Second World War and is too small to fit even one year group in, so assemblies are live streamed. This building still smells exactly the same. As soon as you get up those stairs, you can smell the, um, the damp. The school applied to be rebuilt in 2022 but was rejected. Now, the final spots in the government school rebuilding programme in England have been mostly taken up by schools with a specific type of crumbly concrete known as rack. The school doesn't have rack, does it? No, the school's got everything else wrong with it, but what it doesn't have, it doesn't have problems with rack. It feels really frustrating. It feels like we've reached a point where we've tried all avenues to get the funding uh, for our building, um, and we don't seem to fall into any of the categories. So what about the schools that do have rack? School B School in Scarborough also applied in 2022 before receiving new had problems with the concrete. It was turned down then, only to be added last month. This is a building that's, that's tired, it's past its sell-by date. Through the fabric of those buildings, there's, a, there's asbestos within them. It isn't good enough that, that students are having to put up with, and it is put up with, these facilities in, a, in, a 20, in 21st century Britain. The Department for Education said it had identified RAC and confirmed how its removal would be funded in a matter of months and had invested more than £15 billion to improve school buildings since 2015. At Joseph Leckie, there have at least been some improvements over the past 20 years. This one works. But with a bigger group of Year 7 students set to squeeze in from September, there's still much work to be done. This one works. All the taps are working, and lots changed in 20 years. Hazel Shearing, BBC News. The Queen has visited Belfast at the start of a series of engagements in Northern Ireland. Queen Camilla spent time visiting shops on the Lisburn Road. She was asked about the King's health and told well-wishers he was doing very well, but that he was very disappointed he couldn't come. Now, Wales are aiming to reach their third successive Euros. But they can only join the party in Germany this summer by beating Finland tonight. It's a one-match playoff semi-final with the winners facing Poland or Estonia next Tuesday to decide who advances to the tournament. Here's our Wales correspondent, Hal Griffith. The summer of 2016 still lingers in the memory of Welsh football fans. The Euros in France gave supporters something to shout about as their team made it all the way to the semi-finals. Since then, there's been another Euros and a World Cup, with rather less dazzling results. But there is still belief that Wales now belong at major tournaments. The playoffs then provide a chance to prove it. We qualified against all the odds for a World Cup. Disappointed when we got there, but again, it's stepping stones. We've gone forward two, back one from our, from our performances in the World Cup. We've learned from that. If and when we qualified for the Euros, we're hoping again that it's it's forward two steps. The challenge for Wales comes in two parts. First up, Finland, a match they have to win in order to make it through to a playoff final next week against either Poland or Estonia. Both games come with a home advantage and a red wall of fans who fill the Cardiff City Stadium. Hayley's hopes are high. She's already booked accommodation in Germany for the Euros and will be singing her heart out this evening. The standards is going to be absolutely rocking. Um, so we've just got to hope for the best, really. We're, we're doing well in terms of in terms of the squad. We haven't got any injuries. We're strong. We're good to go. I'm quite nervous. <laughs> this is a team which has had to move on since losing its biggest star, Gareth Bale. But others have grown in his absence. 
tonight's game will be a measure of just how far they've come. Howard Griffith, BBC News, Cardiff. Now, weather coming up, but before that, just to tell you, if you have ever dreamt of striking gold, take a look at this. This is the largest gold nugget ever found in England. It weighs 65 grams, to give you some context. And it was found by a metal detectorist in the Shropshire Hills last year. It's being put up for auction. It's expected to fetch between 30,000 and 40,000 pounds. Weather time. As promised, here's Louise Lear. Hello, a bit of sunshine too. Hello, Jane. Yes, brief glimpses of our own little gold nugget, I'm, I'm afraid, today. We had the warmest day of the year so far yesterday, just shy of 19 degrees in Surrey. This is actually not Surrey, but it's in the southeast and it's down in Kent. It's probably where we're going to see the best of the weather and perhaps the warmth of today. Different story further north and west because, yes, we've got some rain. We're chasing the pot of gold, perhaps through the rainbows in East Rome. And that's because you're closest to this area of low pressure. So a north-south divide with the weather story today and with this strong gusty winds, the ice well squeezing together, it really will be quite noticeable out there. We've got a little bit of light patchy drizzly rain moving its way across northern England and north Wales. Heavier bursts across uh, western Scotland and Northern Ireland. That's going to be the story through the rest of the afternoon, accompanied by gusts of winds in excess of 50, 60 miles an hour. Perhaps some late afternoon sunshine here, though, and maybe the best of the breaks in the cloud across uh, southeast England, where we could see temperatures peaking at around 16 or 17 degrees the high, but generally we're looking at around 10 to 13 Celsius. Now, as we go through the evening and overnight tonight, a blanket of cloud and rain sinks its way steadily south and east. That'll prevent temperatures from falling too far here. Clearer skies, a few scattered showers further north, so we'll see temperatures around four or five degrees, but double figures down to the south once again. So we're going to start off tomorrow on a cloudy, dull, damp note. That frontal system will take its time to clear away. Brighter skies behind, but some gusty winds, gales, severe gales perhaps in the far northwest, and that'll drive in a real rush of showers as we go through the day. So temperatures generally around 7 to 9 degrees, but highest values a little bit cooler and fresher at around 12 Celsius into the southeast because of that cloud and rain. So the mild air is going to be squeezed over to the near continent into the weekend. A really messy start to our weekend, I'm afraid. Low pressure dominates the wind direction of north or northwesterly, and that's going to drive in a frequent rush of showers. There'll be wintry to higher ground in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Hail and rumbles of thunder. But if you dodge the showers and get some sunshine and a little bit of shelter, it'll be relatively pleasant. But a cooler feel, and generally those gusts of winds, 30 to 45 mile an hour. So here's our temperatures, a colder story into the start of the weekend, 9 to 10 degrees. Sunday will be a little bit more quiet, a little bit more straightforward, dry with some sunny spells coming through. But again, temperatures a little bit subdued for this time of year. Jane. All right, Louise, thank you very much. And that is the BBC News at one. Now it's time for the news, of course, wherever you are. Have a very good afternoon. Bye-bye.